Hi, I am Tracy Leslie, senior pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Lafayette. Hear this scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter one, beginning at verse 35. <clears throat> the next day, John the Baptist again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, come and see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Now, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe this because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. He said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is the gospel of our Lord. The Atwater Eye Care Center at Indiana University changed my life. Many of you are aware that I have dry eye disease. Years ago, when I heard people talk about dry eye, I think to myself, wow, that must be annoying. Let me tell you, annoying is not the half of it. It's just been within recent years that my condition developed. Initially, my optometrist prescribed over-the-counter drops for moisturizing my eyes. Her next step was to insert plugs into my tear ducts. That helped for a little over a year. My condition progressed. It worsened, and that was all she had to offer me. Those of you at Trinity, those of you who have been there for a while, many may remember Marty Mull. The reason for Marty losing her vision at the end of her life was dry eye disease. As my condition progressed, I could tell I was beginning to lose vision. Then the pain became so intense, it began to interfere with my ability to concentrate and to sleep. During the night, I'd toss and turn uncomfortable with the pain, never falling into a deep recuperative sleep. I wake up every morning just exhausted. One afternoon, 
I was in a session with my spiritual director when the subject of my dry eyes came up. And he said, you know, I've had some serious eye issues, but I've gone to the eye clinic on the IUPUI campus. It really helped me. If you don't mind my drive, you might want to try it. <clears throat> as miserable as I was, I figured it was worth the try. Now, when I called the Glick Eye Center at IUPUI, I was informed that the dry eye specialists were all on the main campus in Bloomington. Now, honestly, I really don't mind the drive to Indy. I do it pretty frequently, but Bloomington? Ugh. It's like that old joke about how you can't get there from here. I mean, there's just no straight shot down to Bloomington. But if you're miserable enough, you will try anything, right? Well, long story short, though, it took a bit of time, and it continues actually to take quite a bit of time and work with all the different medications and treatments and things that I have. My vision has improved. And I rarely have any discomfort at all. It is amazing. What a difference. The Atwater Eye Clinic at IU has made in my quality of life. And it all started with my spiritual director mentioning that the IU clinic had made a big difference for him. And perhaps it could make a difference for me. I mean, I'm not a native Hoosier. I didn't even know how you had a school of optometry. I wouldn't have ever known how much better my life could be without my spiritual director's recommendation. Within the church, the Bible stories we hear on the Sundays after Epiphany are often stories designed to reveal Jesus. After all, that's what the word epiphany means, a revelation or manifestation. In fact, just a few verses before the passage that I read, John the Baptist explains the reason for his ministry, saying, I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he, he being Jesus, might be revealed to Israel. Discipleship involves recognition. Our journey of discipleship begins with Jesus being revealed to us, an ongoing revelation or understanding that matures and deepens over time as we walk the path of discipleship over the course of our lives. But it often takes others whom we trust to point out what we might not recognize on our own. When we think about the call of Jesus' disciples, many of us envision those fishermen in their boats and Jesus proclaiming authoritatively, follow me, a bold and direct call over their lives. Many of us comment that we would love to hear Jesus speak to us in such a clear, direct, unmistakable way. That's not really the norm. And it's rarely how discipleship happens in the Gospel of John. In this morning's passage from John, Jesus gathers five disciples and only one of them are directly called by Jesus. The remaining four are guided toward Jesus by those with whom they are already in relationship. Teachers, friends, family members. This current sermon series is entitled this little light of mine. And it's about a word that makes most a Methodist, most Methodist shudder. Evangelism. The word might make us cringe as it conjures up images of religious cold calls. But what if that's not what evangelism is? What if evangelism could be understood differently? In her book, Models of Evangelism, Priscilla Pope Levinson notes, five essential qualities of evangelism. The first is hospitality, which we talked about over the past two weeks. The word hospitality means love of strangers. Through the expression of hospitality, strangers become friends. And friends, because of their love 
for us and their loyalty toward us earn the right to speak truth into our lives. When I know that people love me, they can say things to me that I would never accept, never receive from a stranger who I would probably tell to mind their own business. A model of, evan of evangelism that involves religious cold calls is disrespectful and ineffective, at least in my opinion. And so Levinson notes that authentic relationship is essential to evangelism. Within the Gospel of John, we discover this relational model of evangelism. Jesus' first two disciples are initially disciples of John the Baptist. They turn to follow Jesus because John, their trusted teacher, looks at Jesus passing by them and exclaims, look, here is the Lamb of God. John has already earned their trust as a teacher and mentor. He's already prepared them to be on the lookout for Jesus. So they're ready. When John points out that Jesus is the one, look, he says, and they begin to follow. And as they begin to follow, Jesus turns and sees them and addresses them with a powerful question. Tisitio. Honestly, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the Greek word zeteo, Z-E-T-E-O, means seeking. And this tiny little word tis can actually be translated as who, what, or why. Who are they seeking? What are they seeking? And why are they seeking? What a question. So deep and probing. They give a strange response, don't they? Not an answer to the question Jesus asked. They ask a question of their own. Teacher, where are you abiding? In other words, where are you hanging out? Perhaps that was the first thing that popped into their heads when their minds were blown by such a deep piercing question. So he just like bleh, blurted it out there. Or perhaps such a deep piercing question has confirmed for them that this really is the one, the Messiah, the son of God, the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. And so right there on the spot, they decide that this guy is worth the investment of their time. Like the long drive from Lafayette down to Bloomington. They want to be where this guy is. And because they think that this guy could be the guy they've all been waiting for, they can't wait to tell others. Andrew goes and tells his brother the news, and Philip goes to see his friend Nathaniel, who is apparently a skeptic and a bit sarcastic. But not immune to revelation. When Jesus's initial engagement with him demonstrates that Jesus knows his nature and his character, Nathaniel's blown away and proclaims, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. High praise from a sarcastic skeptic. Perhaps you remember the Fabergé shampoo commercial from the 1980s with Heather Locklear. If you don't remember it, just check it out on YouTube, right? Where you can find everything. The commercial begins with Locklear telling us how when she first tried Fabergé organic shampoo with pure wheat germ oil and honey, it was so good. She told two friends about it and they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. As Locklear speaks, her screenshot multiplies exponentially from one to two to four to 16 Heather Locklears on the screen. It's like a giant Zoom meeting before Zoom existed. She continues by telling us how wonderful the shampoo is and then invites us, the audience, to, quote, try it and you'll tell your friends about it and they'll tell their friends and so on, and so on, and so on. Oh, it might seem a bit strange to compare Jesus to an organic shampoo, but I hope you see my point here. 
In fact, many of us would be quicker to tell someone about our favorite shampoo or mechanic or coffee shop than we would to talk with them about Jesus. But why? Who better to tell them? They already know us and trust us. We already have a relationship and if something has changed our lives for the better, whether it's a shampoo or an eye doctor, wouldn't we want to share that good news? Again, Levinson shares the statistics that a relationship with a Christian is the number one reason why people gravitate toward Christianity. 86% of Christians trace the origins of their faith to the influence of someone with whom they were already in trusted relationship. Sharing Jesus with others doesn't have to be painful or awkward. It doesn't have to, in fact, I would say it shouldn't involve telling people what to think or what to do. It doesn't need to involve preaching or thumping people over the head with scripture. It simply involves sharing our own first person experience, just as we see happen in this morning's Bible story. But here's another thing. Even if we are introverts, which many of us at Trinity are, we need to invest in new relationships. Over my years as a pastor, I have so often heard church members say to me, but all my friends and family, they're already Christians. They already go to church. Well, then it's time to make some new friends. You don't have to get rid of the old ones, just make some new ones. And you don't have to like do anything weird, like run a personal ad or go around interrupting people's conversations in the coffee shop. Just notice who's already around you at work, at the gym, in your neighborhood, at the coffee shop. With whom are you already engaged in small talk and pleasantries? Just take one more step. Begin to build a relationship with one of those. So it's about going just a little deeper into the conversation. It doesn't have to be weird. Just listen for an opening to discuss something you're both obviously interested in. Gardening, brewing the perfect cup of coffee, how you can work together to get better snacks in the break room. Whatever. Start there and let your relationship progress naturally. But before you do that, here's something else you're going to need to do. Set aside a bit of time to quietly consider what is the seeking you have found in Jesus? Let me ask that question again. What is the seeking you have found in Jesus? That was a powerful question Jesus asked those two disciples, right? How would you answer that question? What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Why are you looking? How has Jesus been the answer to the seeking in your life. Perhaps Jesus has given you that long sought after sense of peace or the comfort of realizing that you are never alone. Or has it been the recognition that God accepts you no matter who, as you are, no matter how others have judged you? Has it been the realization that you don't need to earn God's love by outperforming those around you? What was the seeking in your life? And how is Jesus an answer to your seeking? What were you seeking? How did Jesus answer that seeking? Once you can answer that question for yourself, then you'll be ready. You'll be equipped to 
to engage in conversation with others who are seeking. From there, you can simply pray and listen and be ready to share your experience of Jesus with others who are also seeking. My spiritual director recognized my need for eye care and that the Glick Eye Center had met that need for him. So he was ready to share his experience with me when I expressed my need. And I'm so thankful that he did. Every day that I can see clearly, every night that I can sleep peacefully, I am so thankful for his willingness to share his story with me and the way that it changed my life. Amen.